this is a day I've been really looking forward to because I'm very lucky to be joined at Mapperton in the hall by Tim Connor, who is an extremely distinguished historian who has been working at Mapperton and elsewhere um, on local history uh, and is responsible for this fantastic book, which if you don't have, you should rush out and get. You certainly should. Because it's flying off the shelves <laughs> and there won't be many copies left. <laughs> but um, Tim, um, perhaps it would be, you would do a better job of, of introducing yourself than, than I can. And then we can talk a bit about the book and, and what you've uncovered about Mafferton. Well, I was a schoolmaster and I retired oh, over 15 years ago to Dorset. And suddenly I made it my business to find out more and more and more about this locality. And I've written a series of little booklets about other houses <coughs> in the area, about particular buildings, because my interest is primarily in architecture. And then suddenly uh, Lord Sandwich said to me, why didn't I write a book about Mapperton? Well, that was a wonderful idea because it's a fantastic house and really interesting mm -hmm. and full of detail. But also, what I didn't know when I started was that Mapperton was a tiny little parish and the records for that parish were almost as interesting as the rather few records that survived mm -hmm. about the house. So the book became much more than just an account of the house and the grand architecture and the people who lived in it, but also the people who lived in the area uh, in houses that sometimes survive, not always, uh, and who worshipped in the church and whose daily lives into real detail could occasionally be reconstructed. So that became mm. something really special. And Mapperton is very unusual in uh, parishes in Dorset for the amount mm. of information, even for so small a place as this. So. so that's, and that's really interesting, isn't it? Because often also when we think about Mapperton, we think about the house and the gardens and perhaps the immediate community. But of course, Mapperton was really at least three different yes. communities, one of which is, is no longer with us. Well, that's one of the other extraordinary things that out there, probably, in the period up to the 17th century, there was a village where the garden is, where the stables are, where the, uh, the new rectory is, uh, and beyond. There were probably many houses of people who were the original Mapperton settlement. But when the Great uh, Plague came in the 1660s, it apparently wiped out the population there, uh, they had no means of preventing uh, contagion and they just about all died. And as a result, the houses around the big house were pulled down and um, we have instead the stables and so on, but no houses at all. There's a, there's a reference of the tenements falling into the Lord's hands. That's is it. that right? That's it. Which is to say that because so many had died from the plague, the houses, I suppose, were empty yeah. and redundant. And, because and there redundant. Wasn't, there, there wasn't, wasn't, people there wasn't to a take population. On. I mean, in those days, when you had a tenement, you generally had it for three <clears> lives. <throat> you, your son, and with luck, your grandson. Well, they'd all died. Yeah. There was no, and there was nobody locally to take up that, the tenement. So the houses like Coltley, nearly a mile away up the hill, survive. But the houses here were just empty and not worth keeping. Yeah. Let's go back to and follow a bit of a chronology yeah. here so that um, we can bring viewers with us because there's an arc of Mapperton really, isn't there, that extends as far as we know from the Doomsday Book through to today and, <laughs> we, and we hope beyond. Yeah. But, um, but Going back to the kind of earliest Mapperton history that you were able to get your hands on, um, there's a family called the Brits. Yes. Who you think were probably the earliest owners of a substantial house here 
which is no longer here because it was built over. Yes, I mean, we are probably sitting on the site of the earliest house at Mapperton, but the building we're in is a house of the, let's say, late 17th century, which replaces, and here I'm not very exact, the house of the 1550s, and that might replace the house of the Bretts who had been here since the 14th century. So it goes back and back, and only the first two stages do we have any physical evidence of, and the rest, just about the rest, is um, conjecture. This is, seems to be the case. Um, I hope I'll have a chance to go and see the cellars this morning, ah. because they had a visitor with me a month ago, and he wondered whether there might be not some trace of the Brett house, uh, a doorway on the uh, east side of the house, and possibly visible in the cellars, some trace of a yet earlier building. But I don't know, and it's not clear. And um, we then think of the earliest Morgan, because mm. the Morgans played a very prominent role in the history of Mapperton, who married a Brett. Yes. Um, and that was, um, uh, and then, and then um, Robert and Mary Morgan, who were the descendants of that first John Morgan, I believe it was. It. Is that correct? Yes. Um, but it was really um, Robert Morgan and his wife who made the first. Yes. If I had X-ray eyes yeah. and could look through that uh, fireplace there, I might be able to see the famous inscription in which it says uh, Robert and Mary Morgan built this house and what they had they gave and so on and so forth. Um, but that uh, chimney piece was put there in about 1911 and it completely covers what people recorded as somewhere in this building, somewhere in this hall and most probably over the fireplace. Um, Robert, and Robert Morgan and Mary, his wife, built this house in their own lifetime at their own charge and cost. What they spent, that they lent. What they gave, that they have. What they left, that they lost. Lost. That's yes, that. well, there was a lot of loss. It was a downhill day. all the way for a few <laughs> decades after that because their son um, was executed for murder. This is a very dramatic tale. <laughs> and this, is, this, was, this is another John Morgan. Yes. And um, describe to us, give, give us a bit of context of the political and social history at the time. The real um, problem in most of rural England was the uh, contrast and conflict between the Protestants and the Catholics. And it wasn't just a matter of religion. There was the deep and real threat that the Catholics would be supported by the King of Spain, by far the most powerful man in Europe, the man who in tried to invade England in the Armada in 1588. The Catholics were a real threat. And uh, it appears that John Morgan was probably a Catholic and he... Uh, <clears throat> fell into a row with his brother-in-law, his sister's husband, not in the house, but uh, outside Wells, where the brother-in-law lived. And in a row that appears to have burst out of a cloudless sky, he assaulted him, stabbed him and killed him. John Morgan's sister was, the, the, the wife of the dead man, was the principal uh, means by which her brother was arrested and uh, eventually tried and executed um, for murder. And he was imprisoned and by the most extraordinary uh, coincidence there survived a letter that he wrote from um, prison to his mother and another one to his sister. The letters have disappeared but they were published 
in the 19th century, so we know what he said. It's rather poignant, isn't oh, it? Oh, it's amazing. I mean, this is, a, this is a man who has murdered the husband of his sister and is about to be executed himself. And if I just read a little bit from here, he writes to her, Thou hast the best-natured mother alive. I have written that she may love thee, yet thou art a simple woman in an open field. It's an amazing... It's a slightly condescending moment. It's an amazing comment. One wonders whether the sister was a bit naive or this a simple woman in an open field might mean that she uh, <clears throat> didn't quite understand what was going, what was on. going on. But um, it's a letter of contrition and um, independence, I he, think. He ends it <clears throat> saying, forgive me and pray for me written by the dying hand of sometimes thy brother, now by thee overthrown, because of course she had been part of the effort to get him <coughs> held to account for his crime. Exactly, now by thee, thee overthrown. It's a very telling comment. <coughs> it's, it's not the only dramatic story of that period, is it? It is quite <laughs> extraordinary that there, if you think of any house in England, um, there's very few written letters that survive from the period. But in the case of the parish of Mapperton, there are two letters that survive written within, I don't know, five or six years of each other, both by men, both by people on the eve of their execution. Now, John Morgan, who was a Catholic, and was executed for murder. Um, the other one was a Catholic priest who had been arrested and was about to be executed for uh, treason, because it was thought that Catholic priests were um, in league with the Spanish. And he wrote a similar extraordinary comment to probably a local man, a William Douch, the family Douch, uh, of Douch were millers in, in, in Mapperton, and it may well have been to uh, that family. I mean, that, that letter is, is also astonishing, and I'll read a, a bit from that. But, but what we know of John Munden, who was living at Coltley, um, is that he actually went to Rome in order to join a seminary to become ordained as a Catholic priest. Surely that was an immensely dangerous thing to do and he would have returned was. he would have returned to this country <clears throat> knowing that he was quite likely to be yes, he, picked he, up he, he he came just at the point when um a, a series of catholic priests were coming into england in the early 1680s uh, sorry the 1580s to um try to preserve the catholic faith and possibly to uh, increase the number of convince Catholics and conceivably to overthrow the Protestant regime. He had been at school at Winchester College, he'd been to Oxford, he had given up his fellowship at Oxford because of his Catholic faith. And then he takes this extraordinary step, as you say, of going abroad, going to a seminary in France and then to Rome to be um, ordained uh, and then on his return, he was almost immediately arrested. <laughs> Pick, picked up on picked his up. way west. Yes. Probably to come back here I would to proselytise. So. And uh, he would have got into trouble at some point, wouldn't he? Oh, yes. <laughs> he was really. Um, but he writes in, in this letter um, addressed to his cousin, I am warned to prepare against tomorrow to go to die. And yet I hope in Jesus Christ to live forever. And having almost forgotten you, and others, my friends, was like to have passed you in silence. And then he sends his good wishes, uh, in particular to his old headmaster at Winchester, which resonates for me because I've got a son at Winchester. Um, <laughs> and we might have to get Nestor to go and do some digging. Oh, seeing, that would be interesting. Seeing, seeing if there are any, any archives yes. on the Winchester side. Yes, there might, there might, there might be some, conceivably be. some records. They've obviously got a lot yeah. of material. Well, um, those stories... Um, uh, are extraordinary, but then we, we have to sort of turn full circle and look at this from a Protestant perspective and a Puritan 
perspective with the arrival of a new rector yes, yes. at Mapperton, um, George Bowden, who, who caused a few ripples. Is well, it he absolutely did. did. I mean, the context of, I mean, he, in, a, in a parish like Mapperton, you would have had a rector who would have been a very potent figure, an important figure, probably um, in many ways the most important figure yes, alongside yes. the Lord of the Manor. Um, and so he would have come in, and what would he have, what would he have been taking on in a parish like this? Well, his... the, the parish priest in Mapperton in the late 16th century, for 50, 40 years of the late 16th century, had been an old, possibly French, um, priest uh, who appears to have been very conservative. And it was in those circumstances that uh, 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 John Morgan uh, had continued a Catholic here. But when the new regime came, because uh, the Morgan family died out and were succeeded by um, the Broderick family, who uh, Richard Broderick married um, the daughter of one of the Morgans, and that's how they came to the house. The rectors, a succession of rectors, were clearly staunch, not to say really annoying, Protestants. Uh, when I say annoying, we've got some wonderful um, reports from um, local uh, members of the parish to the Dean of Salisbury saying the new rector is a terrible nuisance. He is doing all sorts of things that we are not used to. He refuses to wear vestments. He condemns our beliefs. He um, uh, uh, doesn't allow us to do what we've always done and behave in the way we always have done in church and um, is making life very, very difficult. <laughs> uh, and George Bowden was the first uh, and there's a series of complaints made about him in the late 1590s and then it appears that life settles down and he remains in post. He has a family, he... Um, witnesses the wills of parishioners, life gradually returns to something more placid and he survives right into the 1640s. Yes, um, and by this time we, as you say, we've moved over from the Morgans to the Brodrips and I wonder now whether we should turn our attention um, to, I mean there are two Brodrips in particular that are important from the point of view of the architectural history of, of Mapperton. But what's rather challenging is that there are no fewer than four Richard Brodrips. <laughs> yes. So you've really got to call them Richard I, Richard II, third and fourth, and so on. And I think it's Richard Brodrip II who, um, who really um, takes on a lot of, um, of uh, changes to the house. Um, and so from an architectural standpoint, he, he really makes his mark. Do you want to just describe? Yes, well, I think he... I might make just a slight qualification to that. Richard I, Brodrip, who yeah. uh, inherited the uh, property in the first decade of the 17th century and lasted right through to the 1650s, was clearly a very austere, very... Um, devout, staunch Protestant. And although there's not much evidence, there's, it's clear from this room that he did change the house he inherited. That archway there and the porch behind me were both, I'm sure, uh, brought in in the period in the 1620s. But when he died, he said to, in his very poignant will that he left all his plate to his, all his silver plate, that is, to his children, and it amounted to 12 silver spoons. Nothing more. Now, 12 silver spoons was absolutely standard to the most humble um, tenant farmer, but all that R Richard Broderick I had was 12 silver spoons. He died in 1657 before he knew that the Cromwellian regime that he supported uh, would, would uh, collapse. And he was succeeded by his grandson. And it is his grandson who rebuilt this part of the house 
It's not clear when, but it's almost certainly in the years after the restoration of Charles II, when the difficult years of the Interregnum and Cromwell were over, and he rebuilt this house with these uh, cross uh, mullion windows in probably the 1660s. And that's an interesting time from our family history's perspective, because it's, of course, the period when the first Earl of Sandwich is playing a major part in the Restoration, bringing back Charles II. II. Yes. Um, meanwhile, all of this work is, is going on at Mapperton. Please help support this important part of England's heritage by becoming a patron at patreon.com forward slash Mapperton Live. Just on the Silver Spoons point, Silver Spoons appear quite often in your book because <laughs> it appears that, that Silver Spoons were a sort of form of currency. They were, they were things of value that were left quite frequently in, in wills. But very it seems very, seems very surprising, though, that Richard Broderick I would have ended up with so little. I mean, he owned Mapperton after all, so why, why yeah. this focus on 12 Well, spoons? I think he was a very, lived a very austere life, and he didn't, I mean, he did have, clearly, he had lands, not only in this parish, but in several other parishes. He was relatively wealthy, but he probably actually avoided um, material possessions, for all yes. we know. He was, a, I think, a, an active Puritan. He would not have wanted uh, elaborate, possessions. Right. So, but even so, 12 silver spoons was, is very, very um, now, little. Now, was this approximately the period of the hearth tax or was that coming in a It comes in later? just immediately after. It's very difficult to know. In um, the hearth tax in this part of Dorset was levied in um, uh, 1664 and it was a tax on the amount of hearths that your I fireplaces. A fireplace. So you were taxed on your fireplaces. That's a rather extraordinary well, it, it, concept today. Well, it's interesting because it? it's a very good index of um, what sort of size of house um, people had. And if you had three hearths, uh, which probably means two hearths in your house and one in your bake house, perhaps, um, that was the scale of a ordinary, if one dare say so, a tenant farmer. That was a quite normal uh, distribution. Um, uh, Richard, if I remember rightly, at, at Mapperton had 10. ten. It was 10 at Mapperton, yes. 19 at Parnham, yes. which is down the road, but only nine at Melpash. Yes, I think. Um, but I mean, 10 is, is quite a serious house and this, th that means that there were possibly, uh, again, outbuildings with, with um, hearths, but also the main hearths in the house. But it gives a stage that whereas a normal tenant farmer would have three, this house had ten. And, and back to, to Richard Broderick II for a moment then. Um, this hall faces west. The entrance to the house is to the west. Previously, the original John Morgan house would probably have had its entrance facing a different direction. What do I, you think? What do you think? I don't know. There's one extraordinary extra to the house of the Morgans, which appears to have dis uh, in no longer visible. And that is that on the east side, in that direction over there, looking down over what has become the gardens, there was a two-story oriel window, projecting bow window. Which is uh, a, that's a bow window that doesn't go all the way to the ground. No, it does go to all it the way. It does go, this one yes, did. So this. both stories. Both stories. Um, if you look up in that, in the bedroom up, the main bedroom up in the corner, yeah. you can see perhaps, I wonder about this, um, remains of the original mullions of that window. Right. But um, it suggests that he overlooked a garden which we know nothing of. Right. That perhaps those two rectangular pools and that tall building go back to Elizabeth's time. Really? And we've got a couple of entrances yes. that look much earlier. Yes. One hidden behind the panelling um, yes. on the north front of the house, north facade. And then there's another that leads down to the cloakroom here. Mm. What, what do you think the function of those entrances was, was at that time? Were they more important? They must have been because... 
Yes, once... that's a much larger entrance than it is. You know, now we just come out of a tiny little door into the garden through the back. But at some point, there was a more substantial entrance. Uh, yes, I, I'm very undecided as to what the significance of that uh, entrance there. It, it clearly uh, seems to me to uh, predate the Morgan Building. Right. It doesn't have the uh, decoration, remarkable decoration, heraldic decoration of the Morgan buildings. Uh, and it may be a survival, even if moved from some other place, of the Brett House. Of the Brett House. I haven't... But the oriel window is part of the Morgan development of the yeah. 1550s. Yeah. So, um, so he also developed the... Um, or built the Dove House, yes. the stables, and I believe added or improved or remodeled the nave of the church. Is that right? Yes. Um, the Dove House and the stables were built in the decade after the Restoration, so in the 1660s. And the, there's a date of 1670 on the arch of the stables. But then at the end of his life, uh, he died in 1704, um, he rebuilt the nave of the church, um, as people have noticed, to look as much like the house as possible. He didn't want the church to be very different, um, though it would have been pretty different because at that point it had a, a tower. The tower didn't fall down until the 1770s. So we see the courtyard at Mapperton and it looks like a house with two wings, one of which turns out to be the church and the other of which is part of the house. But originally there was a tower there, so one mustn't think of it as looking too like the, the house. And the, the tower is an extension of where there is yes, an existing yes, tower. Yes, yes. And what would it have looked like? What, what, what examples are there of other Well, churches? almost we any other know? church... Um, uh, would have it, it's said to have had battlements and pinnacles, so there would have been a crenellated arrangement like that around the pinnacle. around the top, around the top. Yes, yeah. and a window, and probably um, certainly at the rest at the Reformation, it had three bells. And um, one of the parishioners complained that Robert Morgan had taken one of the bells <laughs> and um, was trying to flog it. But um, you know, one doesn't know any more than that. Shall we move on to? Um, some other Richard Brodrips. So we've, I think we've got to Richard Brodrip the second. <laughs> we, Richard Brodrip the third was important um, insofar as he made a very important marriage, didn't he, that brought a certain amount of wealth? Well, they did marry uh, pretty well. Um, the uh, <clears throat> real uh, connection, I think, was the last of the Richards, um, in that um, he was a nephew of um, Richard Broderick III. They're all distinguished by their a slight political um, attempts. They tried to get into Parliament and never really succeeded very happily. Well, there's a rather interesting moment in the book when you, you refer to all of the various owners of Mapperton who've attempted to become MPs, and successively they managed it for days or perhaps a year <laughs> in one case. But none survived as an MP for as long as my grandfather. No, who, absolutely. Who, who, Once the Montagues came, <laughs> their, their, their political career was more, more stable for a time. For a time. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, um, but anyway, back to, to Richard III. Well, Richard III and Richard IV are living in the 18th century. Uh, Richard IV died, in, I think, in 1774. And he's responsible for remodelling the north front of the house and um, for laying out the parterres for uh, garden space immediately to the north. Um, he's an interesting man. One wishes one had just a little more um, evidence about him. In the book, I show a photograph of a tiny slip of paper, um, which is all that survives of his account book, um, which records going to the theatre, buying a book, visiting something, giving somebody a, a little tip. And one clearly has got just the fragment of what would be a riveting account book. One could be able to see, able to see everything that he clearly explained. He was the sort of person who kept accounts. And this um, 
was an amazing, would have been an amazing thing. And all we've got, as I say, is a piece of paper two inches high. <laughs> he uh, designed the North Front uh, and he uh, decorated uh, the uh, main drawing room with uh, a, a, a carved chimney piece. He employed a local firm of builders, when I say local, I mean they were based in Dorset, called Bastard, um, and they designed the um, staircase uh, in the North Wing as well. And, and created a, a, a Georgian yes. North Front, yes, which yes. was quite different to how it would have looked? Yes, it, would. it, it because was certainly it... very different. I mean, whereas Tudor windows are essentially uh, flat rectangles, um, Georgian windows are tall rectangles. And leaving out the decoration of those, the uh, dimensions and the shape was would have been very very different and it's symmetrical and the two stories look equal which they certainly don't on on the north side here and he and he covered up the the tudor door would it have been yes i the... i don't have an explanation for that we, I really we do and i've looked at that and it just yes, doesn't I... quite work and no. it doesn't also line up with the parterre that no it would, that would have been there it, as it... well that we have evidence of from photos when when the grass gets very dry and you can yes. see the outline yes. of where the planting would have been. It, and, and also not only was there the planting in front of the house, there was the beginnings of an avenue stretching to the west um, which clearly didn't last and it didn't last because the next stage was that the house was empty. Um, Richard IV had no sons and a daughter married into a house a family in Hampshire, and this house was simply empty. From 1774 until the 1820s, I have no evidence at all of anybody living in it. Probably somebody did, but maybe a, 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 a tenant or a local farmer, and the house must have you, mouldered. You, but you'd have imagined that its interiors, that its that the chattels, the furniture and the pictures would all have gone. It would have been actually an empty shell, because if they hadn't gone, how would you have ensured their survival? I have no knowledge. Yeah. I mean, I simply do not know. It, the house was visited by the first historian of Dorset, John Hutchins, the rector of Wareham, uh, in the 1760s. And he records in this room um, painted glass and one portrait, at least. He mentions one portrait, the portrait, indeed, of Robert Morgan. Disappeared. Yeah. No sign of it at all. Presumably, the family that inherited the house, the, they were called Compton, may have moved them over to their house in, in Hampshire, but possibly not. Possibly they were just allowed to fall down a wreck. <clears throat> well. Now, um, the Comptons were a landed family. They had other estates. And so actually, Mapperton formed a smaller part of their wider holdings yeah and that was part of the reason that Mapperton wasn't yes. looked after it wasn't it was neglected it wasn't somewhere that they wanted to be because they had somewhere grander they had well somewhere where they had always been somewhere it, where it, 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 they the Comptons had been at this uh, in Hampshire since the 16th century why on earth should they come and live here and they didn't and occasionally members of the family might um, uh, live in it but most of the time as far as I know uh, it was let out to anybody who would take it. Um, army officers on leave. Or um, a solution was eventually found when the rector of Mapperton to, uh, was um, one of the brothers of the Comptons uh, in Hampshire. And he lived here firstly at the rectory and then um, for 20 years, from 1880 until he died in 1900 and six I think, um, in the house itself. And this was, this was Paulet, Paulet Compton. Compton. Yes. And what, what do we know about him? He was a Victorian. He was you, I, I read in your book that he enjoyed hunting with fox, hunting foxes and, and sort of country pursuits. Um, what, but, he, but he also sounds like a, quite a kind of community spirited sort of man. He yes, was, I, he I wanted to really um, involve tenants and celebrate, I mean, there's a, there's a lovely description of the Prince of Wales's 
um, wedding and yes. the celebrations that went on here. Well, it, it was celebrations that went on in the pouring rain and they all trooped up the hill to Coltley for a bonfire, which must have been very, very damp. Uh, and, uh, and they had rockets as well. And they, they had they rockets, rockets from, special fireworks to, to fire off. down from London. Uh, uh, and uh, they stood there in the rain uh, celebrating the Prince of Wales' wedding. This is in the 1860s. And um, he did, I mean, he's only recorded in local papers. Again, one's got no... Um, none of his letters seemed to survive. He had one daughter and she clearly was quite keen on animal husbandry and bred horses and bred cattle. Um, but uh, he was not very much more than a local vicar, really. Right. Though right. a wealthy man, and of course he took his holidays abroad and lived a completely different life elsewhere. Right, right, right. And um, I mean, that brings us really into the 20th century because uh, I mean Mapperton has followed this extraordinarily circuitous path to get to the Montague family and we're nearly there because it was my <laughs> grandfather who who bought um, Mapperton when it was for sale in 1955 but before he did that um, yes. there was the story of Mrs Labuschagne. Well um, Mapperton was sold in 1919 uh, along with a vast number of other houses and estates. Uh, the co combination of death duties, of deaths in the war, uh, made running these big estates very, very difficult. And the, um, <clears throat> the death of uh, the Compton heir in 1922 uh, was another factor. But the house, the house and the estate were sold to... Um, a banker, a London banker, called Labouchere, and he died, and his wife came to live here, and lived here until her 90s. She died in 1955, and um, she is responsible for two very important things. Firstly, she uh, carried out substantial uh, restoration of the house, um, and uh, put in uh, a, a new roof, which was very substantial. She put in this ceiling, actually, also, um, because uh, nobody had ever got round to a, uh, an original plaster ceiling here before she intervened. But much more famously than either of those things, she built or created the garden that we now see down in the valley um, on the site, perhaps, of an earlier garden which had completely disappeared. And in that, we think she might have been influenced by Harold Pito. Yes. Who was obviously a, a major um, uh, landscape designer and celebrated um, garden designer of that period um, because of the Italianate nature of, yes. of the garden. The symmetry, the arrangement around a central pool, the careful um, paths leading from it all suggest that sort of interest in uh, formality, which lends uh, itself very cleverly to the remarkable uh, profile of the space in which it fits, because it is in the very sharply pointed valley uh, that the um, paths and the central pool are placed. And she built the grottos, she built the fountain court, she put in place the topiary, and we think she liked to paint, that she would sit in the grottos, which each had their own fireplace, so she could... At least yes, keep those, her, those fireplaces keep her... are most extraordinary. When you look at them, yeah. you realise that the, the jams of the side and the top are using the uh, framework of the windows of the uh, Morgan house, which she oh, I think replaced. She, she'd, she'd taken them... Well, I mean, she was reusing what had been no here. longer fit for purpose on the house itself. Right. So, um, yes, and she used to sit there. How did you discover that? You just sort of... Well, they look the same. I they mean, that's the where same. they must have come so from. So do you think they would have been sitting in a pile somewhere here that she was yes. aware of? I mean... And then she went and raided them to say... Let's, uh, let's reuse this and make use of the stone. The last Compton owner of the house began the process of restoration which Mrs. Labouchere um, 
continued. And when I say restoration, what I mean is he was taking this house that his uncle, Paul Mildmay Compton, had lived in, rather rackety for a long time, and trying to restore it back to what it should have been in the time of the Morgans. So the Tudor windows were renewed, just exactly as they had been. Compton was trying to bring it back yes. to how it might have been. Was that, a, was that a wide, Henry Francis Compton, was that a wider trend of that period? Yes, he wasn't uh, ahead of the curve in doing this. There's a house nearby called Athelhampton, which had been very comprehensively re um, in um, the 1880s and 1890s. The same was happening in a rather eccentric way at Parnham, down the hill. Um, but here uh, <clears throat> Henry Francis Compton had uh, begun the process uh, and renewing the windows was one of the forms this took. That's why the, there was this, these uh, uh, segments of window which he reused. And, and he did something else as well, didn't he, which was rather to the detriment of another local house because the Comptons at that time didn't just own Mapperton, they also owned Melplash Court. And I think he must, I mean, what would he have been thinking to, to decide that he was going to, to pillage and take away the overmantle from one house and replace it here? And poor old Melplash. Well, yes, I suppose he made the decision that Melplash was expendable, that he didn't want the two houses, that he might sell it at some point, and that this could be improved, in his opinion, by the insertion of this enormous uh, chimney piece here and another one in the library, um, both of them more or less in keeping with what was here, though it's important to say that the house was, uh, Mapperton is a house of the 1550s and he was putting into it uh, a, a, an overmantel that has the date 1604. So it was neither one thing nor the other, actually. But anyway, it, it all uh, added to the general impression of oldness, which is what they were after in 1910. Um, and in a way, um, with Henry Francis Compton and Ethel Labuschere, um, we see the last major alterations, don't yes. we? Um, because these days, we wouldn't be allowed for one second <laughs> to bring an overmantle from somewhere else or to add a wing or to, to insert a new style of windows because all of these houses are now quite <coughs> rightly listed and very strictly controlled in terms of, of what we're allowed to do. Um, and it's, it's an interesting um, point because when I read Tim's book, which again I encourage you to purchase and, and enjoy, um, you look back at the history of Mapperton, and it is a history of, of owners, but it's also a, a history of the, the imprint that they've made mm. on these places. It's much harder to make a physical imprint these days. Yes, um, but then houses are no longer, in a sense, lived in in the way that they were before. Um, it's very difficult to imagine bringing up a family in the grand formal spaces of these houses. So um, it's, and also uh, tastes of what people want to see in houses has, I think, altered. Yes. And yes. so um, the new sort of impact takes an entirely different form. The, we've, we've talked a lot about the house and the owners and the architectural history. Um, I mean, Ethel Labouchere, uh, died in the 50s mm -hmm. and then the house was put on the market and bought by my grandfather and lived in by him until the mid 90s when my parents took over actually running the place in the late 80s and I took over in roughly 2016 with Julie. Um, so we see these successive generations making their mark but actually there's, there are many stories to be told beyond the main house, because part of what you were saying earlier is that, is that this is a story of the parish, of the wider parish, of the different communities, and we've got, a, we've got rich records of the details of some of those lives. Now, one of the things that, that I found quite entertaining um, was learning about, and I hope I pronounce it correctly, the presentments 
or is it presentments? How do we? I think I think it's presentments. Presentments. I don't know. <laughs> now, the presentments was the were the opportunity for the local church wardens essentially to snitch on their neighbours <laughs> for bad behaviour. And you've got some lovely examples well, of what was going on. Um, the organisation of par uh, the church in uh, early modern England is very different from what it is now. One of its responsibilities then was all sort of moral behaviour. And it was the duty of um, the church wardens to present any people whose behaviour um, was judged to be um, incorrect. And so occasionally um, one has the written presentments made by the uh, church wardens to the dean, who was the man who controlled it, the dean of Salisbury, uh, uh, saying what was going on in the parish. Now, this is very unusual because uh, of its survival. Presentments made to the Dean of Salisbury survived. Presentments made to anybody else, which counts for the most of the parishes in Dorset, were all burnt in a great fire in the 1730s, and we don't know about most parishes. But we do know about the parish, however little, of Mapperton. And... Um, the behaviour of uh, various people in microscopic detail is recorded. We've, we've got some lovely examples here that you quote. And so John Munden himself was a, was a warden at the time. It's, I think a different John Is it Munden? a different John yes, Munden? Yes. Oh. Um, but he reports that, um, that Mary Webb, who would have been a member of the community, did confess that Henry Trivet hath had carnal copulation with her. <laughs> um, but in the same sentence it continues, all else is in good order as far as we know. They reported on the maintenance of the church, the maintenance of the churchyard, um, whether the bells are working, whether the, um, uh, uh, the rector is carrying out uh, divine service appropriately. All these are recorded. And then there is this extra moral dimension to the behaviour of... Oh, and there's this other case. I do remember, really remarkable, um, where somebody got wild and... The fight in the churchyard. Yeah, fight in the churchyard. Here we, yeah. Well, here we go. Oh, go on. Um, yes. So, so you've, you've, you've quoted here um, that uh, there was a rumour in relation to an incident much closer to home a few months later when... Now, it's, oh, wait it's a minute. Yes, the background is that I think John Travis was accused of having an affair with somebody else. Uh, it, with apart John, from John his, Abbott, yes. the wife of Abbott of Whitchurch. Yes, uh, uh, and his wife was clearly um, receiving all sorts of rumours about nefarious behaviour of her husband. And somebody must have said something in church and she went, lo lo lost her. So it, so, it, so it then led to the following... The giving of a blow in the churchyard of Mapperton in the ninth day of December, immediately after which, in morning prayer, Richard Wyatt, being one of the sidesmen, was about to strike again the tithing man. So there's, there's really a lot of... Um, I mean, she clearly lost her temper with people locally and started to assault them and was prevented. And... The record, record of this um, tiny little burst of temper, that it should be preserved at all, is very remarkable, and that it should be the culmination of a series of um, nasty rumours about the behaviour of her husband. Um, that's the sort of detail that one can sometimes uncover. Yeah. We also um, have information from uh, various records of life at um, a village that is no longer extant at Mapperton, which is the village of Mythe. And Mythe, you, un you must have uncovered, actually means the confluence of two streams. They're very small streams. They I are very small streams. Um, where there was once a mill. And actually, we've, um, we've visited Mythe and we've filmed oh, that, right. um, that stream and looked at um, the position, the likely position of the mill. Um, 
But what was interesting to me was that, that um, there was a requirement for tenants to use the mill, and it was, it was a reasonably substantial mill for the area, well, which suggests that there can't have been terribly many larger mills. Um, no, I think mills were very small outfits, and given the fall of water that one can see from the streams now, it can't have ground very much. And not only that, but the water supply uh, was variable, and there are several accounts of the miller being presented for using his mill on a Sunday. <laughs> well, I tend to feel that it wasn't because he wouldn't go to church, it was because it had just rained and there was some water, <laughs> so he had to mill uh, then, and... Um, you know, he just couldn't turn up for church for that very reason that it's at last raining and I can get on with some milling. <laughs> so, you know, it, the church had to take second it was, place. It was a difficult life at Mythe, as described. It, I mean, yes. Perhaps, I think perhaps most... not much more difficult than in other, um, uh, you know, poor areas of the estate. But, um, but some of the descriptions, I think there's one in particular of, of um, an, an inhabitant who describes that she only ever got to eat half an egg and never more. You know, <laughs> yes, and, and that, that, we're now talking of the 1950s, yeah. um, that uh, the, the rural poverty of England is something we entirely have forgotten. Uh, the reminiscence of a lady called um, Flory, who published her memoir, I suppose, 20 years ago now, uh, records her growing up in real poverty, in a whole series of villages, occasionally in Mythe, sometimes over at Hook, at four or five miles away. Um, and she makes this reference that um, they, you know, she would have half an egg uh, for a meal. Half an, we, we um, interestingly enough, we have um, a, uh, a supporter of Mapperton Live called John Maybe. And the Maybes were the other prominent family alongside the Legs, ah. where there are successive records yes. of, of births and deaths. And it was his um, ancestor who lived and grew up at Mythe, um, ah. but went over to Utah with the Church of Latter-day Saints. Oh, really? As a Mormon. And, oh. and not only that, but the grandson of the chap who emigrated became the governor of Utah. So it's a wonderful... Oh, that is fascinating because I got very interested on another context on the Mormons leaving um, Bridport in the mid-19th century. And if only I'd known that connection, I would have been thrilled to bits. Oh, well, you now know it. You would be thrilled now. <laughs> there we are now. And John yeah. maybe brings his family here from oh. Utah every so often. Oh, how to, very to, interesting. To celebrate the place where they Oh, I must follow that up. From. That's very it's interesting. A, it's a lovely mm. story. Mm. Um, and then you've also got some, some really interesting descriptions of, of Marsh Farm um, and the arrival of mechanisation. Because we think of this last period, um, I mean, obviously a lot changes in farming over the decades, but there were some really profound changes in the first half of the, the 20th century that, yes, that quite fundamentally change the nature of the countryside. And there's a lovely description of a, of a steam engine at Marsh Farm. Uh, 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 at Marsh Farm. <clears throat> the um, most important change in farming was the replacement of human labour by mechanisation. Uh, and <clears throat> with it, with the arrival of mechanisation, with the arrival of tractors, and we're talking the 1940s and 1950s, um, <clears throat> We see the replacement of the horse and the shrinkage almost immediately over the, um, the next few years of the number of men employed. Each farm dwindles from a community perhaps of as many as 20 people to a community of four or three or by now two. And that change and the change of uh, a residence that goes with it, people no longer living in the country, their houses fall empty. And what does an estate do with all these empty houses? And following on the consequences of mechanisation of um, agriculture, um, we get the arrival of new tenants on the estate, tenants who have nothing whatever to do 
with its agricultural origins and, and who want to simply live in the buildings, which is, which is obviously gives these buildings um, a new life. But, it, but nevertheless, the impacts of that are still felt today because we have so many redundant agricultural buildings at Mapperton, many of which are in a terrible state of disrepair and have fallen down. Um, and that is all linked to the, the changes in the number of people that are required as agriculture has become more intensive. But going back to Marsh Farm, I'm just going to read um, the description of the steam engine. The old engine would pull, pull into the rickyard. Barrels would have to be filled with water the night before, coal to be hauled, and ricks stripped of their thatch. Smoke and steam everywhere, and rats to be knocked down as they escaped, but it was all very enjoyable and a real team <laughs> job. Yes, the notion of the team that is involved, the large number of men in any one farm, uh, all collaborating to make whatever was going to happen take place, is the nature of farming from the Middle Ages through to the 1940s and 50s. And then it stopped. And then it stopped. <coughs> Which almost brings us to today. But I've got one more question related to something I picked up in, in your book, which is a reference in the Western Gazette to Queen Elizabeth <laughs> taking a bath. <laughs> now, that's rather interesting because we do refer to what has been described as a cold bath in the garden as Queen Elizabeth's bath. But which Queen Elizabeth? And is it true? And, you know, what, what do we know about um, about that, and what's your view of what that that tank essentially was used for? Because different people have different opinions about it. I I think that those rectangular pools are old. By that I mean they are early modern. Probably they are 16th century. They may even be earlier. They may have been used for keeping fish in for the house. Uh, given that um, eating fish was a, a requirement. Uh, they would have needed a supply of fish. So like the dove, the dove, dove cot, yes. was really a supply of meat in the winter, wasn't it? Yes. You'd be able yes. to just climb up a ladder and pick out a dove. Queen Elizabeth's swimming habits is something I don't know very much about. <laughs> and uh, therefore, it's not very clear to me that uh, Queen Elizabeth came within oh, 50 miles of Mapperton ever in her life. She got around, she went on these enormous progresses and they're very fully documented and it's not clear that she came. It, we owe uh, this rumour of Queen Elizabeth's um, behaviour to the Western Gazette. Now, I'm sure modern journalism is very, very trustworthy, but it seems to me it's generally called hype. Hype? <laughs> Embellishment. 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 Uh, you know, well, what that... would have been nice if only it had happened. Yeah. <clears throat> um, well, Tim, I suppose um, when you find yourself, as, as Julie and I do now, responsible for the management and development of Mapperton, and um, we look back at this incredibly rich history, um, it makes us feel rather small in the context of all the things that have happened at Mapperton. And sometimes it's hard to see the things that one is bringing to a place like this, because we live in very, very different times. The way that we live in the house is, is quite different even to my parents who were living more on this side and had fewer visitors coming. We're, we're mostly in the back of the house. Um, but we've, we've already brought in quite a few changes um, to encourage more people to come. But from your perspective, as you look at this, this arc, what, what do you see? And do you see this this, um, do you see this happening elsewhere as well? Are there, are, is there a kind of common thread between contemporary custodians of these places that, that, that makes sense to you? I think one of the most interesting things is to look at the way in which grand houses like this managed through the 20th century. One of the most common things they did was to open themselves to visitors. And they paid their ticket and they went round the house and they had a conducted tour and by and large they also had tea. Now that isn't going to last forever. That was a habit of the 20th century. 
the 21st century has all sorts of other concerns. Uh, the natural world is finite. The climate is changing. The world is warming. We are infinitely more aware than we ever were of our responsibility for and dependence upon the natural world. Maybe the era of a comfortable afternoon's visit to a historic home is only a temporary habit, only a 20th century habit, and a new generation is going to want to see different things in the countryside. And Mapperton, it seems to me, is very interesting as an estate for the sense that it is in the process of changing away from the traditional mid-20th century stately home and tea visit towards developing its natural um, riches and its natural um, advantages and presenting them as what you come to Mapperton to see. And the uh, natural resources can be a countryside which by good chance has not been too much interfered with. Economically, Mapperton's estate has not been profitable for decades. You could not support a great house like this and the family that lives in it on the, process, on the proceeds of agriculture alone. Well, perhaps it's time not any longer to depend on a, a pasture farming and sheep. It couldn't work. So develop in some other ways. And I think opening it up to um, people who might be interested in nature study in all sorts of different 21st century ways, looking at rare orchids, finding extraordinary fungi, looking at wild birds, camping in the midst of this countryside, and the whole process also of rewilding, which has developed in this in the last 20 years to an extent that people could not have foreseen when we were celebrating the millennium. Tim, you've just given a most marvellous plug <laughs> for Mapperton Wildlands, which is on the cusp of launching here in the UK. I mean, we've been going for a year with eco, limited ecotourism, so people coming out joining uh, guided tours to look at the things that you're talking about. But this year, we're going to be launching a whole series, uh, more tours, more specialist tours, tours um, to come and discover uh, bat activities in the evenings, to watch the deer and the rutting season, uh, to explore the fungi, as you say. I think that um, we've got, we've, we're terribly lucky here, not only with the topography, but also the existing flora and fauna. It's very rich. It hasn't been decimated so much by intensive agriculture because these hills have been really hard to farm, yes, that's which the is point. part of the reason they're not terribly productive in, in agricultural terms, um, but in biodiversity terms, they're very, very rich. And we want people, as you say, to come here and celebrate that. And I think if, if that can be one of the things that, that we leave behind, um, then that is absolutely wonderful. So thank you for that plug. I'm going to end by giving you another plug for your marvellous book. You didn't just write it, but you designed this extremely attractive um, front cover and probably the back and all the, all the bits in the middle. <laughs> it was great fun actually putting together the illustrations. I think that's what makes these books worth uh, owning is that you, it's not just the text, it is absolutely the pictures as well. It's the pictures as well, and, and, and it's the kind of love and attention that has gone into this and that you clearly feel for your subject. So thank you. My pleasure. Good.